Thomas Bjorkman, welcome to the high level consultations on financing change and changing finance within the context of jumpstarting the economy after the COVID 19. So, from your perspective, being such a force for good in the world that you are, how would you do it better? How, what are the main acupuncture points that you would activate from your perspective in order to create the future that we all want? Thank you, Mariana. That, that was a, a, a very large question and, and, not, and not, uh, not an easy question to answer, not, not, not even if we got to 30 minutes or, or, or even more. But of course, it's, uh, it's the question of, of, of the time. So we, we, we somehow, as a collective, want to uh, get back to a functioning world. And even if we have all noticed now during this period of, of lockdown that uh, this lockdown has had a positive impact on both the planet and on on other uh, parameters as as well. Of course, it is not a sustainable situation, so we need to somehow get out of this situation and and, and get into a situation where uh, we are in a functioning society. But then the question, of course, is is, is our instinct that we would like to. Uh, go back to business as usual as quick as possible. Is that a sound instinct? And, and of course, implied in your question is the answer, which I completely agree with, that no, we don't want to uh, go back to business as usual. We cannot go back to business as usual because business as usual is what actually brought us to this point. So we do need to get back to a functioning world but it's not back to, to the old world. So how do we do that? And uh, uh, can we even hope that that will be possible? And uh, of course, if we look back to, uh, to the last time we, we had an equal uh, opportunity, or at least a opportunity to uh, r really um, uh, start on something new, that, that was during the financial crisis of, uh, 2008 and and of course we were many even in the financial industry and back then I had at least half a, a foot still in the financial industry uh, as, as you know I'm a former in investment banker and was in the investment banking world uh, for, for more than 20 years but exited that world about 10 years ago to start my own uh, foundation in in Stockholm the Oak Island Foundation where we are looking at the connection between the inner transformation and societal transformation and how our inner world and our outer world all sort of are interconnected and interlinked. But then back then, of course, uh, even some of us within the financial industry saw this crisis as an opportunity to reform a, a system, a financial, global financial system that was obviously not working. And even though we back then had Obama in the White House, we completely lost that opportunity. And uh, in, in the panic of saving the uh, uh, financial system, and we should remember that we were just sort of 24 or 48 hours away from a total global financial meltdown after the US government let Lehman brother uh, filed for bankruptcy. Uh, had one kept that off-hand policy for, for another 24 hours, probably you, uh, we would have had a complete uh, meltdown. Uh, but even though we were at this point and so close to, to the brink, uh, most of the efforts to uh, jumpstart the economy and prop up the, the system after that crisis only resulted in cementing the, the old system. And uh, now again, I mean, we, we are right now in this corona crisis, but I can also see a new financial crisis building up in, in the background of all this. So the question is, is it possible for us to see this as an opportunity for transformation? 
or will we go back to just go back to something that is uh, very similar to what we what we had before and you were asking for acupuncture points here and um, I think my my way of, of um, addressing this question would be to um, um, use the very simple but very useful uh, model or tool of Bill Sharp called the Three Horizons and making a, a, a distinction between th three horizons uh, of this problem. And the first horizon is, is, of course, what can we do within the present system to make the present system function a bit better and, and to reduce the immediate suffering. And that, that is an important horizon to focus on. But then you have the third horizon, if we jump to that first. Uh, and that is, how could we possibly imagine uh, a new system, a transformed system, that is possibly uh, working in a completely different way from the present system? And can we even do that? Can we even have that imagination in, in a world that is moving so fast and has got so many emergent properties that makes it even in theory impossible to sort of predict, let, let alone manage uh, the future? Uh, and then between the present horizon, the first horizon and the third horizon, we have the second horizon, which might be uh, um, policies and, and things that we need to put in place in order for us to move from the present system into a, a future system, but that are not necessarily part of the future system, but more functions as scaffoldings that we might hope that we could uh, dismantle once we are into this new system. And just to give an example there, I, I think, for example, the universal basic income is a second horizon, or might be a second horizon solution, something that is not part of, of, of my view of, of the system where we hope to move into, but that might be a necessary uh, uh, scaffold to help us uh, let go of the present system and dare to lean forward into an emergent new system. So um, a lot of the discussion right now on uh, what to do right now is naturally focusing on the first horizon. What policies should we put in place? Should we make sure that any rescue packages are conditioned with uh, uh, environmental uh, concerns, making sure that we do not uh, subsidize uh, industries that are not beneficial for, for people and planet in the long term. And, and even if we give uh, subsidies, for example, to um, airline operators, uh, should we make sure that we put some severe constraints on how they could be used and, and demand a transition to, to a more greener transpo transportation? And I think, yes, we should. Uh, and that could be many of those things that could, could be mentioned. Um, but I think my focus when it comes to, to pressure points, acupuncture points, are more on the third horizon. W what can we do and, and how can we envision uh, a new system? And then um, I might first start to say that I think that the transition that we are facing, whether we are at the start of it now or whether this transition comes in five years, 10 years or 20 years, we are heading towards a major transition. Uh, I would even call it a bifurcation point in, in the world system. And I see the world system as a self-organizing, uh, uh, evolving system and as any self-organizing evolving system, you come to a, a point where uh, the present way of organizing that system does not hold any longer. And when the system is under such pressure, then the system can go two ways. You can either have a systemic breakdown where you lose a lot of complexity in the system that would 
in the world system today mean that we would lose a lot of the things that we gained during the last uh, 200 years in, in terms of complex uh, industrial and technological achievement, but also achievements in terms of democracy and human rights and other things. Uh, possibly all, all of that could break down and we could end up in a very fragmented world. Or uh, the system can possibly reorganize on a more complex, but also perhaps deeper and more um, nuanced way of, of organizing. But that uh, will not happen automatically. Uh, we, we will definitely need to actively support such an emergent uh, transition. And there, perhaps a little bit controversial, um, I think that the, that the most important thing that we can do right now in that transition is actually to support uh, the development of our awareness and the development of our ability to, to relate to ourselves, to other people, relate to society and relate to, to the planet. And some would even call that uh, a step up in human, in human consciousness, both on an individual level and on a collective level. So yes, we are facing a, a, a very, very um, severe crisis and the way out is either to step up or face uh, a breakdown, to break through or to break uh, down. Sorry, that was a long, a long mon mon monologue. No, that's extremely important. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, you, you're taking the time to really structure the thinking and also provide some, you know, some um, line, lines along which we can continue this conversation. Uh, I think it's extremely important to set the stage. And I agree with you uh, a thousand percent. So in going back to, let's stick to your model, horizon number one, where we support existing system, but while we use them to move along, we change it slowly but surely, not only the systems themselves, but ensure that people have money in their pockets to continue supporting the economy the economy gets going again and while we do that we imagine new better systems that are more sustainable ubi being one of them and also support the mindset transformation the shift so i i could not agree more with you so from your perspective what economic models would you suggest should be considered and adopted slowly but surely mm -hmm. and again from the climate perspective uh, we know from science that we only have 10 years to do yeah. something to prevent uh, the worst climate calamities that uh, would await us if we don't change our ways so what economic system question one you you would be supporting or you have developed and number two, what coming back to the financial conversation, what are the fault lines of the current financial system that we should begin the transformation yeah. on or with? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, th th this, the, your first question there about the financial models, I think that that is a very uh, important question. And, uh, um, of course, the, the models that we have been using for the last hundred years and that are still dominating the, the economic discourse all, all over the world uh, are the neoclassical uh, economic models. And um, th this model has, has more or less be become so dominant that we are confusing the model and, and reality. We are starting to believe that the assumptions that were originally made in the neoclassical models, such assumptions that we are all uh, these rational, individualistic uh, consumers that are uh, constantly trying to maximize our own utility, that we have perfect information and that we always make these 
rational decisions. Uh, we are almost starting to believe that uh, that is how the market is functioning, or at least how the market should be functioning. That we are homo economicus. Homo economicus, yes. And we're <laughs> starting to believe that we are homo yep. e e e economicus. And that is, of course, dangerous. And we can already now, today, of course, see in, in, in the, the last 10 or 20 years, that has been many alternatives to this neoclassical model. And they are finally now getting a bit of ground, gaining a bit of ground, even if they have been very, very well established within the narrow disciplines. And I'm thinking, for example, of behavior economics, of course, that is a bit closer to, to, to psychology, that are actually examining uh, real human decision making and behavior and, and finding out that, of course, we are not making these rational decisions, which, of course, marketers have, have been knowing for, for uh, hundreds of years, so, so uh, or at least a hundred years when, when modern psychological marketing was invented. So it's been quite interesting to see how at, at uh, university and at business school, how in the business department, how you have, at one hand, you have the, the teachers of, of macroeconomy that is sort of making this assumption about irrational human beings. And then you go on to the marketing course, and there, of course, you learn that that is not at all how we fu humans function. But that has not yet reached back into macroeconomy. But it is now doing that through behavioral economics. And, and as you know, uh, quite a few of the latest uh, Nobel Prizes in, in economy has been awarded to research in the field of behavioral economics. We, we have uh, complexity economics, which is of course close to our heart. We, we, both you and I are, are thinking in, in, in complex system, complex dynamic systems, and uh, complexity economics is trying to describe the economy a, as an evolving dynamic system, uh, which is of course much better than the old equilibrium theory, which we should remember that it was all that was available as mathematical tools to the economists at the end of the 1800s when this model was established. They, they, they were not stupid. I mean, the, the, this was the mathematical modeling tools that were available to them. And back then, they were very aware of the fact that they were making very, very crude assumptions about uh, the actors in the market and the market to, to make the model make the model work. And then finally, uh, going uh, beyond uh, behavioral economics and uh, complexity economics, we have institutional economics. And, and that is perhaps the least known of these new ways of economic thinking, but somehow perhaps I would say the most important one. Because when we are trying to model the um, economics system. Really, any modeling we are doing, or have been doing so far, rests under the assumption, more or less, that the market that we are trying to model is a natural phenomenon. Uh, and, and that we are here as observers, and we are trying to model it in, in, in better or not, not so good ways. But of course, a very, very important insight. And when we are think, talking about this transition, this transformation of, of the system and how we need to transform our, the way we look upon the world and ourselves, our worldview, then the realization that most of the things that we have around us as humans, most of the aspects, of the human society, and not the least the market, are actually human constructs, uh, are what sociologists would, would call uh, part of our socially constructed reality, uh, our collective imaginary, some call it. And, and that is at first a ver very difficult thing to take in, because from an evolutionary point, our, our our mind is not really um, wired to see the world out there as socially constructed because during Stone, stone Age, uh, and that's, it's the stone age, stone age environment that our minds are adapted to evolutionary, uh, of course, there were not as much social constructs as there are today. 
So we are not naturally inclined to, to see these things as social constructions. But we should be aware that the market and even the free market, uh, if such a thing exists, um, is a social construct. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, uh, some, some philosophers or economists talk about that you have two different rules in the market. You have the regulating rules that comes from the outside and can regulate things. You can have price controls and things like that, trying, trying to uh, shift the behavior of the market. And uh, neoliberal economists have always quite rightly pointed out that any such regular uh, regulating rules uh, is um, affecting the efficiency of the market. And of course, efficiency is not the only human value, so sometimes that, that, that could be uh, accepted that we lose efficiency, but, but we do lose uh, efficiency. But then we have the, the second type of rules, and they are the constitutive rules of the market. And they are the rules that we need even to be able to talk about the market. And that is, for example, rules about um, what can be owned and who can own something. And of course, we should be aware of that about 80% of all the goods traded in the international uh, markets today are uh, of intellectual property right types. So they are really const constructs. And another way to, to say it is, can, can you own uh, uh, DNA? Can, can you own another person? No, you can't own another person. We have, we have decided that we abolished slavery a long time ago, but can you patent the DNA or, or, or part of DNA or not? And if you can patent something, for how long would that patent be valid? What is a copyright? What can be copyrighted? And for how long do you have a copyright? And these are the types of constitutive rules that are necessary for even for the market to start. If we take the example with football, just throwing a ball out on the field and having 22 persons chase it, that, that would, would not uh, constitute football. So you need to have some sort of rules even for the game to start. And it's the same, it's the same with the market. And if there is one acupuncture point right now, when it comes to sort of tweaking the present system in the first horizon, I would say it's definitely looking at these constitutive rules and, and to see, can we, do them, uh, can we do them better and not just take them for granted. And for these constitutive rules, uh, we would also of course include not just what can be owned, but also who can own things. And the fact that uh, a corporation can own things just like a human being can. And in many ways with, with uh, present legislation or at least interpretation of, of the present le legislation can acquire rules that we usually uh, and rights that, that we usually just attribute to, uh, to natural persons is of course something that we should be aware of and that we should, uh, uh, that we should question. So by really starting to see the market as a human construct and taking responsibility for that. I think that is a, is a big step forward. And I should say that what made me start to think and write about this was my actually my experience in the banking world and how I could see from the horizon of being a board member of a small Swiss bank. Um, we, were, we were not sort of very active in the lobbying market, but of course we, we saw what was going on with the with the big uh, global actors and how the finance industry collectively uh, were a very strong lobbying force for the legislators to constantly tweak these constitutive rules so that the market would um, clear uh, in a way that is more uh, preferable for the industry rather than for, for our 
uh, customers or for, for the general good for, for, for society. And when I became aware of these efforts within the banking industry, it was also easy to see how, how these efforts were going on within the uh, pharma industry and media industry and the big food industry and, and everywhere. And how many times the legislatures were just very naive. And the fact that there was nobody on the other side sort of lobbying for, 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 the, for the collective good. Uh, the, the reports and the recommendations for new legislation were were very sort of um, coming only from from the industry itself, and of course tweaking the rules in to the, to the benefit of of the of the industry. So if we all become aware of how much we can do just within the present system, and find mechanisms and and ways to for the legislators also. Uh, express not only what is good for the particular in industries and special interests, but also for the normal con consumer and, and for society in, in general. That, that would be a very important first step, I think. Yes, right, which brings us to the uh, measurement criteria. How do we measure? Because we can only achieve what you measure. we measure. So when you're talking about banking and the uh, influence uh, lobbying, the only measurement criterion that we're currently using is money for profit. Yeah. And we even, that's reflected in the constructs that we have. Yes. It's a for profit, not for profit. Uh, as yeah. a serial entrepreneur, you have to make a decision very beginning. Are you creating a for profit organization or a not for profit, like a, yeah. a social whatever? And then yeah, you think that you're better than others, but then actually you're going on the other side and begging, con con competing with your social, uh, other social entrepreneurs for the money that you're actually criticizing and not wanting to have, but you still need it in order to function. So this is this kind of schizophrenia yes. that we find in, in our systems. So going back to what you just said, and by the way, I think the, the word consumer is already a terrible word that we're, we've been taught to use uh, because we're consuming. So yes. please consume more. Yes. When it comes to the representation- we are also passive there. I mean, we, we, we can express our, our choice in our consumer choice, but uh, then we only can choose by what is already presented to us in, in the market. We can only choose from what is already available on the shelves in the supermarket, so to say. Exactly. And because nobody represents the air or water or the yeah. earth or the planet as a whole, uh, that these no notions are not being included in the yeah. for-profit only measurement criteria. Yeah. So coming back to the finance uh, sector and how we appreciate or put a, a stamp on value, capital. How yeah. can we influence uh, regulators and the judiciary in taking the people and the planet along with well-being factors, joy and happiness, da da da, and so on, into the current traditional measurement criterion for success? So that would be a step in the right direction in coming up with a more general definition of capital. Hmm. Yes, yes. Um, and, and, and we should do that. And, and we are doing that, of course, when we are talking about triple bottom line and, and other ways of trying to weigh in more things, uh, more diff different values than just profit in, into our decision uh, process. But still, when we are trying to do that, we are still within the paradigm of, um, of uh, money. And um, of course, when, when money was in, invented, and the reason why money and the market in its present format is so um, efficient is, of course, that if you have a lot of different human values, a, a huge value space, and then you project all of those values down to just one dimension, and that is price, price or profit. Um, of course, you gain a lot in efficiency. 
and especially in in a society where information transformation uh, uh, trans transmission where well, information transmission is, is a very limited factor which it has been in in all of humanity up until essentially now uh, you gain so much inefficiency by being able to bring all of these values reduce all of these values into just one economic value price and profit but then of course at the same time you lose so much information so much information of for example if this is beneficial for the for the planet or not and uh, w whether this is actually uh, making more people happy or not and, and other things that are just lost in in this uh, reduction um, and of course today yes in horizon one we need to tweak that system because that system is what we are in but i also think that we through technology and the technological development that is going on right now that we are at a point where we will actually be able to to leave this uh, drastic reduction in information uh, that we, we've been forced to do during most of humanity and, and be able to keep a lot more of this information within the market and the market clearing. And what do I mean by that? It sounds very cryptical. Um, well, I'm, I'm talking about, for example, uh, new forms of currencies and cryptocurrencies and and blockchain technology because already today most of our transactions are cleared through uh, through the internet and we are moving rapidly into a world with internets of things and almost every payment i make in sweden is now made by blipping anyhow and uh, i don't even need to take out my card or my wallet and even some shops they do not accept cash any any longer and when transactions are settled uh, electronically like this, then you, you can have a lot of information exchanged in that transaction. And that makes it possible for us to, in say 10 or 20 years, be in a world where, where each economic transaction is not just conducted upon one parameter, parameter that you and I, we meet in a negotiation around the price. And when we found a price that is acceptable to both of us, then we have an exchange. Then clearing mechanism could take much, much more information and much, much more value uh, into account whether a certain transaction will, will clear uh, or not. And in such uh, a situation, we are moving into a completely different market space that could uh, take so many more things into consideration that we wouldn't need as we do today with for example triple bottom line accounting sort of add these aspects on afterwards these aspects could already be built into the clearing of the market and not then as regulations that would lose that would diminish efficiency but rather as constitutive parts of that future market but of course this is still science fiction because we don't have this but i i don't think i'm com completely wrong if i say that even within our our lifetime that we might at least see the start of these types of let's call it deeper markets markets that can handle much much more information so so for me in this transition yeah yes tweak the old system but then let's also be very keep ourselves very open to what might be possible in just a few years and what might want to emerge and i would very much see a lot of even state-sponsored uh, experiments uh, around uh, blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies and these things most of the experiments going on right now we have very interesting experiments going on are usually not government supported and are a bit sort of in the dark or the gray uh, area, uh, but still very, very promising. And then when you also then connect these sort of deeper markets with a possibility of deeper democracy, uh, 
uh, a deeper participation through these technologies also in uh, the democratic process, where again, the process we have today, voting one, once every three or four years and only for one candidate or something, that was the best information process technology we, we had 100 years ago or 200 years ago when democracy was uh, invented. But today we can do it in deeper ways without uh, sort of going towards uh, a, di a, a too much a direct democracy where we as uh, citizens are supposed to express our opinion on every issue in direct uh, voting, because I don't believe in that type of, of direct democracy at all. And I think that we've, the, last, the latest developments, both of social media and uh, of populism, has shown us that just as the, as the uh, uh, behavioral psychologists and behavioral economists tells us, human decision making and specifically collective decision making is a very difficult process that we need to assure that those that are involved in those processes are very committed to the processes and also have enough time and uh, cognitive uh, space to actually engage in those processes. And that would not be the case if we were to vote on Facebook on every political issue that comes up. Right, which brings us to a topic that you're an expert on, and that would be education. Because uh, you know, when you hunt for a job these days, you have to show your diploma, your qualifications, uh, but you don't have to show any qualifications whatsoever when it comes to voting. Just because you're a citizen of some country, uh, you can just vote and you're 18 years old or whatever the age might may be. So, and you, how, how can we connect these two, education? Yeah. Uh, and because as you said, and I, I fully agree with you, the complexity is now reflected in the, the tools that we're using and the gadgets. Yeah. And everyone yeah. pick, can pick and choose according to mm -hmm. his or her cognitive mm -hmm. ability to understand or not understand. Yeah. Yeah. more or less of that Abs absolutely absolutely but but i also think it's important to 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 stress that i think that, that the uh, current research when it comes to decision making processes also has shown us that uh, given the right given the right amount of time and giving the right scaffolding for decision processes um, most people are actually capable of making wise decisions. Um, so I don't think that this is sort of uh, a question of educating people, giving them a diploma and just letting an, an educated elite be able to, to participate in democracy. That would be the wrong way. No, that's because, not what I meant. No, it's not no, a, about could, elite. What I said could be interpreted. Okay. Okay. In that way. So I'm more commenting on, on, on what I just said. Okay. It could be interpreted in that way. Um, but if we take the democracy and, and the democratic uh, participation and the responsibility that comes from that seriously, we also need to give everyone, every citizen, yes, education, but also the time and the resources to participate in the democratic process and also perhaps also acknowledge the fact or respect the fact that not everyone cares. And if you don't care, we, sh we shouldn't force someone then just to participate in the decision making process because a non-caring decision is probably not the, the, the best uh, decision. So an example of this is, is the processes that I think have been uh, fairly successful where we have had citizens assemblies uh, being part of, uh, of political processes. And I know, for example, on, on Ireland that they had a successful process there when it came to the changes in legislation about, around abortion, that if, if you take 100 people, even if you take them randomly in society, but then give them the economical freedom to actually look into this area deep in say half a year, 
together with experts and together with facilitators who are used to facilitating both individual and collective decision making, then most of the participants actually step up to that challenge and contribute uh, positively in that process. And some are naturally also finds their way where they can give most of the uh, contribution in that process. Some of these hundred might, might feel called to do the more intellectual researching and fact finding and things like that. And other might be more about the pondering deeper into the, the story and what it means to be human in this context towards this decision, what, what, whatever, it, whatever it is. So well-designed processes can certainly help uh, in, in these deeper democratic uh, processes. But what I think you were referring to when you said, and you, you said that I was an expert in, in education, and I wouldn't call myself, of course, an expert in education in, in any way. I'm a mathematician and physicist by training and investment banker and entrepreneur. But uh, I think what you were referring to that was uh, uh, the book I, uh, I wrote a couple of years ago together with my colleague and friend, and also member of, of the Cover Love of Rome, Lena Anderson. Uh, which is called the Nordic Secret, uh, which is about this um, uh, educational uh, effort th that was made in all the Nordic countries uh, 150 to 100 years ago with the emphasis on giving the possibility for a substantial part of the population to become active co-creators and contributors not only in the democratic process, but actually in the building of society. And if I should just very briefly uh, uh, mention uh, the, the key uh, thesis in, in, in the book, uh, that, that was that uh, 150 years ago, all the Nordic countries were amongst the, the poorest countries in, uh, in Europe. We were poor, we were non-democratic, agrarian, societies. And in Sweden, for example, during the end of the 1800s, up to 30% of the working population emigrated mainly to the US because uh, of the completely bad living conditions in, in, in Sweden back then. And then just a few generations later, even before the Second World War, all the Nordic countries were at the top of the most happy, the richest, the most stable industrial democracies in the world. And of course, this had many uh, reasons, but uh, the main reason Lena and I argued, and certainly the one that has been completely forgotten, was the fact that leading intellectuals and politicians in the Nordic countries 150 years ago knew about the importance of inner personal development when it comes to societal change. And in particular, they were aware of the fact that in times of societal transition, and of course, they saw both industrialization and urbanization coming, modernization, just like we now can see something new coming. Uh, and they knew that in times of these rapid change, it's just so easy for us humans to want to have some sort of external authority to hold on to, like a dogmatic religion or a dogmatic authoritarian leader. But they didn't want to be authoritarian leaders. They were firmly committed to building democracy. And they knew that the only way to build democracy was to build or is to build them from bottom up. So they wanted to empower a substantial part of the population to actually become so grounded in themselves that they could hold the complexity of societal transformation and be active co-creators in the, this process. And the way they did that was through, would it be easy to say mass education, but this was more than education. And I sometimes a bit jokingly say that they created retreat centers and they created retreat centers all over Scandinavia. So at the turn of the last century, 1900, there were a hundred centers like this on, just in Denmark, 75 in Norway and 150 in Sweden where young adults in their 20s could later on with full state subsidies spend up to six months in retreat. 
uh, with the expressed aim of uh, becoming so grounded in themselves and develop their awareness and consciousness to take this very important developmental step that cognitive uh, scientists and developmental psychologists today are referring to moving from a socialized mind to a self-authoring mind. And when this was at its height, almost exactly 100 years ago, then 10% of each young generation in the Nordic countries participated in one of these half year long programs. And of course that created some sort of critical mass within society, especially since these 10% were not just some sort of uh, elite group, but they came from all walks of life. And actually a majority of the participants were from farming or working class background. And I certainly think that when we are today facing this societal transition, and when so many of us are again looking for external authority and authoritarian uh, leadership, uh, the way forward is actually to help uh, enough many people to become that grounded in themselves and feel secure enough that they can open up to, to the possibilities and not necessarily just hold on to an old system, but open up to the possibilities and perhaps even become active co-creators in that process. And of course then, things like universal basic income could help with that. Again, providing these sort of programs for lifelong development and uh, lifelong learning, but also lifelong inner growth could certainly also help. Do I see the experience of what we did in Scandinavia more than a hundred years ago as a blueprint? No but it's certainly a case study showing that when we, like you and I, are talking about the importance of consciousness development in society, that this is not some new fancy idea, but this is actually something that has been tried. And it has been tried in more than one country, uh, more than a hundred years ago, and it actually worked. So as a case study showing that focusing on developing the awareness and the consciousness of a large part of the population, if not the whole population, is perhaps a prerequisite for a positive uh, transformation into a new uh, global system. Brilliant. The question now would be, how can we bring this into the forefront of what needs to happen right now? And how can we accelerate the, pro, uh, pro, uh, the project? That would be a, a project. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and yeah, go ahead. Sure. No, I was, I was just going to say that, that um, again, uh, uh, I, can see, I can see the danger in uh, the technological development that we are going through right now. Uh, but I'm basically uh, positive to, uh, the, the potential that technology has already given us humans and will be giving us in, us in the future. The question is just if we can uh, develop the collective wisdom to actually handle the, the technology that we are developing. So I see at this point, yes, the technology as an answer, both for what we're talking about the new market, new financial systems, that technology can help us there if we use it wisely, but also when it comes to our, our inner development and and certainly there is nothing that can compare with what was actually done in Scandinavia a hundred years ago, actually bringing people together in physical meetings, in retreats, giving people the time to reflect and to relate and, and, and to grow. But also, I think if we should be realistic, uh, could we find ways to use technology today to scale this process and to make it affordably available to millions of people. And that I have to, have to mention a project that I'm myself involved with together with another foundation here in Stockholm called the uh, Northern Lights Foundation, Nordfrim Foundation, where we are developing a technological platform called 29K, 
where we are experimenting with bringing these sort of developmental tools to, to the general public in a non-profit, open source, co-created uh, project. So again, lots of experiment, experimentation with the technological uh, opportunities that are opening up right now, but that this experimentation could not only be driven for, by profit uh, pursuit, but we also need to do experiments that, that are uh, for the benefit of uh, the greater good. And sometimes uh, the profit motive and the benefit for the greater good are, are aligned, certainly when it comes to producing uh, uh, consumer goods, the, the, the market and the general good often coincide, even if the market forgets about the planet and, and the environmental destruction most, most of the time. But then in other uh, instances, then the, the, the market and what is good for, for our society at this point in, in the evolution of humanity do not coincide. And then we need other uh, initiatives. And eventually, just like we did 100 years ago in Scandinavia, we, we need uh, state initiatives. We cannot just rely on philanthropists and, uh, uh, and do-gooders. We, we need to realize that we as a collective in society uh, have the ultimate responsibility for our collective goods. So now we've come full circle and given the sense of urgency that we all have, Let's say you had the opportunity to give uh, the head of the EU Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, three pieces of advice as to what she should do next in order to bring about the transformation and the change that uh, we need to, uh, to implement. What would you tell her? Yeah, and, and a little bit keeping in mind these three horizons. I, 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 I would say that I, I, any subsidies and rescue packages, let, let's make them in, in a green uh, wrapping. Make, make sure that they, are, they, that they support a transformation to uh, a, a more sustainable economy in, in the short run. That would be for the, the first advice. Uh, the, the second advice would be support uh, broad scale consciousness in society and uh, uh, perhaps uh, introduce again these type, these sort of retreats and retreat centers, but across border in in Europe, and let people meet cross border, let people meet new perspectives, let people be challenged in their perspectives and their old thinking, and, and support people to evolve their view of themselves, other people, and 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 the planet. So. EU support for, for increased awareness and consciousness development. And then perhaps the third one would, would be support a lot of technological experiments, especially those that can have impact on a sy systemic level, whether they are experiments with new currencies, new, new markets, new forms of democracy or participatory decision uh, making, or support for personal inner growth and transformation as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time and uh, wisdom nuggets. And um, so let's hope that all of your ideas will be implemented. And th thank you, Mariana, for, for, for wa wanting to uh, talk to me. And, and thank you for your framing and, and your very interesting and important questions. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.